Hey everybody, welcome back to Fantasy Football's Finest. Uh, today I have the pleasure of being joined by our commissioner and my dear friend, Matt Cortina. How you doing, Matt? Really good. Pleasure to be here, Mike. All right. Talk Glad football. Yeah, absolutely. Glad to have you. Uh, it's been a long time coming. I mean, we've had so many conversations in the past, you and I, especially uh, just hours and hours upon end. So uh, I figured it was it was great to get, you know, most of us involved in this and uh, start talking some football. Let's do it. All right. So for those of you that have been following around, uh, this is uh, Fantasy Football's finest mock draft series. Uh, this is going to be part three where we're going to be covering picks 11 through 15, which will be the Jets, the Raiders, the 49ers, Buccaneers, and the Broncos. So that being said, with the 11th pick, the Jets are on the clock. And uh, in my mock, I have the Jets taking Makai Becton, the offensive tackle. Uh, I think that he's a really solid pass protector. Uh, the guys that the Jets took in the offseason, uh, Connor McGovern was good center. Uh, they added George Fant from the Seattle Seahawks. Uh, I don't think he's really that great. He's more of a plug-and-play type of guy. But, you know, like if someone's injured, uh, I think you get a pure pass protector in Makai Becton, and you got to keep Darnold upright and you got to protect him. He's a young kid. If he's taken the beating that he's been over the first, uh, you know, couple of years in the league, then he's not going to stand up right for very long. It's really tough to say what the Jets are going to do. You would think that they're going to go offensive lineman or wide receiver. And if you, you look at to. mock drafts so far, I think that's where, you know, that's where uh, the Jets picks are, are falling into. So you have, you might have a run on offensive line that, third or fourth choice at offensive lineman to how the draft goes or very likely their their top pick of wide receiver and so for me uh i i'm thinking they're they're going to take cd lamb and and run with them uh if you look at the tape uh i i came into this offseason thinking that judy and lamb were kind of on equal footing but look at the tape and lamb is making contested catches all over the field he's so powerful he's so fast he makes every catch reminds me a lot of deandre hopkins and that's a guy that you can have on your team for a decade. Um, and if you're not going to get your top pick at offensive lineman, I would just take the best available wide receiver if I'm the Jets. Plus, you got to think if you're Adam Gase, you know, your best years were in Denver when you had uh, four all-star wide receivers and Peyton Manning. Um, yeah. But I think, he, I think he's trying to – um, or he would want to, uh, you know, get some talent at that position, particularly after you lose Robbie Anderson. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, they have a they have a desperate need at, at offensive linemen, um, but I also think they have a desperate need at wide receiver, and that's why I think they're going to take C.D. Lamb. Yeah, for sure. The other guy I mentioned in that uh, was uh, was Jerry Judy, um, and I think the I think the next pick to the to the Raiders is uh, is where he's going to go. Okay, I like that. See, you, you and I kind of swap picks there. I have C.D. Lamb going, going to the Raiders. And I honestly believe, uh, to kind of touch on your point, uh, C.D. Lamb, I think, is the most explosive. And I honestly think he's the best wide receiver in the draft. When you look at all these Alabama guys coming out, I mean, there's three potentially first-round draft picks coming out, out of Alabama. And when you think about it, I, I kind of touch on this with Tua. Like, is Tua really that great of a quarterback? I mean – He's at Alabama. He looks good. He's throwing to three first-round draft picks, right? So who are you going to cover? Of course, these wide receivers at Alabama are going to, you know, they're, they're getting single coverage every play. Uh, I like Jerry Judy. I think he's good. But I think C.D. Lamb is the best wide receiver in the draft. And I think the Raiders take him here. Uh, they signed Nelson Aguilar in the offseason. And I think after looking at this past season, <laughs> we all know who Nelson Aguilar is. Uh, the internet memes yeah. have been out there. Um, so either way, I, I think we both agree that the Raider, Raiders would be better suited taking a wide receiver here, uh, at least with their first pick uh, in the first round. Can they, they do that too. We didn't pass on a wide receiver at this point. I mean, can they pass on a guy like Jerry Judy when he's in their lap? The Raiders? I don't think so. Yeah. I, I don't think so. I mean, they, they could Too go much ahead down. and grab. I mean, the point about to uh... – Go ahead. To your point about Tua, I mean, not only was he throwing to three All-American wide receivers, let's say, but he had uh, 
Jedrick Wills protecting him, a, a world-class offensive line. Yeah. Alabama always goes four deep on running back. Yeah. Uh, you know, d- should we hold that against Tua? I don't know. That's what teams have to. That's what teams have to decide. Should we hold it against the receivers? No, because you, there's there's precedent for Alabama receivers coming into the pros and then playing well. Oh, ab- absolutely. I mean, you, you could take a look at the, especially just coming from the Falcons. You have Julio Jones and Calvin Ridley, just to name a few, uh, and they are all some of the best coach wide receivers. They're very pro ready. They may take a year or two uh, to really come out, but they're good receivers. No real knock on them, more so a knock on Tua than anything. But One point about that is, you know, wide receiver is one of those positions where uh, it's tough to make an impact in your first year, whereas offensive line, you see guys plugged in right away. I think about mm-hmm. David Doctari with the Packers. Yeah. He was, uh, he, he was kind of an unheralded um, offensive lineman taken, and they plugged him in right away. And then now he's a six-round pick, pick, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so maybe if, you know, maybe if, if teams are on the fence, off, like the Jets, offensive line or wide receiver, maybe they lean towards offensive line if they want immediate help. But if they're looking for a, a longer horizon uh, for their success, then they, they, you know, they should probably take one of these really talented wide receivers. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. Uh, moving on from the Raiders, we have the San Francisco, San Francisco 49ers. They have two first round draft picks. Uh, not a lot of holes on this team. Obviously, they're coming off a devastating Super Bowl loss, uh, which would be Kyle Shanahan's second blown lead in a Super Bowl. Um, <laughs> but the, the 49ers, Kyle Shanahan runs a zone blocking scheme. So you need athletic linemen to be able to get out and block. Uh, Tristan Wirfs, I think, is a, obviously in, from the combine proved to be one of, I mean, the guy couldn't play tight end. He probably would have been the, the top scoring tight end. Uh, you know, if he didn't play offensive line. Uh, he's very athletic. I think he fits that zone blocking scheme perfectly. Uh, he can play tackle or guard. I think he'll probably move inside, play guard, considering that they have uh, um, Joe Staley and um, Mike McGlinky, Glinky, whatever his name is, the kid from Notre Dame, uh, okay. since they got playing tackle. Uh, but adding Tristan Wirfs to the inside, I think bolsters their offensive line and especially helps them out with their stoked running game. Yeah, Wirfs is a is a player that I think a lot of a lot of teams are are eyeing and hoping that he that he falls to them. It's weird how he's, you know, some some projections have him as the top lineman, some have him, you know, fourth or or maybe even fifth. But that versatility, if he, you know, if that's what you're looking for in a lineman, I mean it's it's hard to be it's hard to be worse. He's probably at the top of your lineman board. Um, for me, for the 49ers, I'm looking at the Super Bowl, and I'm looking at the holes on that team. Um, and like you said, there aren't many, uh, but I think their secondary was totally lacking and, and cost them the game against the, against the Chiefs in the Super Bowl. Uh, and you look at Richard Sherman, who's over 30 now, and I think he has one year left on his contract. Uh, you know, in my mock draft, um, you know, I have the uh, – I have the Lions taking Okuda um, at three, um, and and the next the next cornerback up in a in a very sneaky good uh, defensive back class. People aren't really talking about how how deep and how good this class is. Um, I think the 49ers are going to take C.J. Henderson, um, the quarterback the cornerback from uh, from Florida. Um, okay. He's he's so athletic. Um, you know, people are saying he's he's the most athletic corner in the in the draft, even more than even more than Okuda. Um, and if you you know, I, I think I have a theory where Kyle Shanahan's he like he doesn't need. You could also make the case that he's gonna that they're gonna go wide receiver here. Um, you can make the case that they're gonna go uh, offensive line here. But I think Kyle Shanahan thinks that he can scheme around his deficiencies on offense, whereas that team can't really scheme around their lack of talent in the secondary. Mm-hmm. Um, so I could, you know, there's talk about them trading. Very well, that. Um, but if they stay here. Um, they could do worse than than C.J. Henderson. Yeah, uh, I actually love the pick of taking a corner right here. Uh, I mean, they like you said, they got exposed in the Super Bowl. Uh, Richard Sherman is getting a little bit longer in the tooth, and we all know he struggles in man coverage. Uh, I'm sure Darrell Revis can point that out to you via his Twitter. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I mean, the the 49ers 
if if that if, if you're struggling on the back end covering these guys, that pass rush is pretty much null and void, and that's that's what they live off of. They they live and die by the pass rush because if they're not getting to the quarterback, they're they're not winning many football games because the guys can't cover for long. So their yeah. focus is getting to the quarterback within two to three seconds, and if they can't do that, they're probably getting beat over the top by someone with speed, which no is doubt. a high kill. If, if the Jaguars uh, end up passing on Kinlaw, and I think we both have Kinlaw going there, mm-hmm. um, if they end up going with an offensive tackle, which they might do, um, I originally thought that Kinlaw might be a good fit for the 49ers to fortify that defensive line. Oh, That's for sure. Strength. For sure. I mean, they, they traded DeForest Buckner, which was a little bit surprising, but I mean, they got a first round draft pick for him. So I, I don't think you can blame him there. Yeah. Uh, do they really need uh, another first round draft pick on the defensive line? Who knows? But I've, I've, I've seen stranger things. I don't think the 49ers need any more first round draft picks. They've, they've done too well. With yeah. John Lynch has done too good of a job. And for all of us NFC fans, I would like them to have less picks. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And they will have less picks here. Uh, options are they could trade down with either this pick or their later pick. Because after this first round, they don't pick again until the fifth. So that's going to be a little difficult for them to really build a team. Because most of your team is built in rounds three through seven anyway. Yep. Uh, so moving on, we got the Buccaneers, who... I don't think they signed anyone relevant in free agency thus far. So I haven't they, heard of any any quarterback or anything like that going to Tampa. No, definitely not. So, I mean, the segue is that I think you invest that you you, you bring in Tom Brady. You need to invest in your offensive line. Um, the way that my draft is falling, I think they're going to Andrew Thomas here, the offensive lineman from Georgia. And I still have Worfs on my board, but. Andrew Thomas is a bigger, more um, option for them. And you listen to Andrew Thomas talk, and it, and he he says he's the he's the he's the number one offensive lineman in the draft, and and time will time will tell. Uh, but he's he's the more prototypical uh, tackle for uh, for a team that that needs it, and it also needs it because they need to protect Tom Brady. I love him. I, I think he's a great tackle. Comes from a pro offense at Georgia. He's a big dude. He's a mauler in the run game and holds up very well in pass protection. Um, so I mean I could definitely see them doing it. I have I have I have the Dolphins picking him with their first of first round picks. Um, but Buccaneers, I always say that if uh, I can't remember which GM said it, but they always said that if you're drafting for need, then you're not drafting well. Uh, the Buccaneers have a chance this draft to get a quarterback of the future. Tom Brady is okay. Let's make a shot at this. That's fine. But he's he's got a two year contract. He's 42 he's going to be 43 when the season starts is he your quarterback of the future no let's take a look at this as John Kitna and Carson Palmer or even you know <laughs> Brett Favre and Aaron Rodgers so I think the Bucks go after a guy that's been linked to Bruce Arians a lot he's got probably the biggest arm in the draft Justin Herbert he's very athletic you take him you let him sit behind Brady for two years while he's there in Tampa not only does he get to learn from one of the best coaches, but he also gets to learn from one of the best quarterbacks. He learns how to be a pro. And I think Tom Brady walks off into the sunset, whether he wins a Super Bowl or not, walks away from the Buccaneers two years later, and they got Justin Herbert. And now the Buccaneers aren't in a position where it's like, hey, Tom Brady's gone. We need a quarterback. So they have a guy. He knows Bruce Arians' offense, which can be a little difficult. It's not the easiest of offenses to learn. Uh, and I think he's a perfect guy for for BA down there in Tampa Bay. I, I don't want to see him twice a year, but yeah, Herbert is going to be a, a player that is taken uh, to fit a specific scheme because you watched some of his games last year um, against Washington and, and Eason, and Eason looked like the better quarterback. Yeah, um, and it was because Herbert can be inaccurate at times. He's got a cannon, mm-hmm. um, but he can be uh, inaccurate. So. Um, you know, if there is some history um, or at least some kind of connection like the Bucks and Bruce Arians have with Herbert, that makes a lot of sense if he's still there. Yeah, yeah. Which, I mean, in all likelihood, people are probably going to be, uh, you know, catching quarterback fever in this draft and either people are going to be moving up uh, to grab these guys before someone else takes them or, you know, we could see an Aaron Rodgers-like fall for a lot of these guys, you know, just because people find more pressing needs. 
And one of the things that we're not talking about is the depth. I didn't really understand um, the depth of every position in this draft almost. The, mm-hmm. the, the worst position is interior offensive line. I don't think there are very many centers or guards that are coming out with, when you have guys like um, uh, Quentin Nelson. Like there, there's no top tier interior linemen. So, but everything else, corner, offensive tackle, uh, tight end is a little weak, but wide receiver, quarterback, running back. I mean, these, these positions are just bursting with talent. And the more I get into this, the more I realize that. Yeah. Uh, all right, so next up at pick 15, rounding out this, uh, this uh, part three in our mock draft series, are the Broncos. Uh, Broncos are, are a team that I like. I believe they got the quarterback of the future uh, in Drew Locke. He's athletic. He's got a pretty live arm. I like him. Uh, they've they've done some work on the offensive line uh, in the offseason. They did lose Connor McGovern at center, which I think hurts them a little bit. Uh, but uh, I have them taking Jerry Judy here, which you had the, the Raiders taking a little bit earlier, but he's still available for mine. Uh, you know, Sutton, he had a pretty good season this year. And I think when you add guys like Noah That's Fant tough. and you have guys like Melvin Gordon coming in, you still have Philip Lindsay there. You have, you want to build around Drew Locke and you want to put weapons in place for him. And I think adding a guy like Jerry Judy there, who now you, as a defense to scheme around them, you're going to be, okay, well, do I want to put eight in the box? Uh, Then you're going to leave, you know, Judy and Sutton in man coverage. And you still have Fant, who is a very talented tight end. I really like him. Um, So I think that that puts the Broncos offense in a very good place, drafting a wide receiver there. Once Locke started playing, playing Fant came on and had one of the better half a seasons of for a rookie tight end and mm-hmm. I mean, that, that's a really tough position to break in as a rookie uh, sure. but he had one of the best half seasons of, of a tight end for a rookie um, in recent history Broncos are, are interesting um, they made as you mentioned they made a ton of moves in the offseason um, they could go wide receiver there's a lot of talk out here about that um, they could go offensive line um, that, that's kind of been the bane of this team for a long time. Their left tackle, Garrett Bowles, is kind of the whipping boy because he has a holding penalty every single game. Yeah. Um, they, had, they brought in Juwan James last year from Miami, who had a ton of injuries. And they let go of Matt Paradis two years ago, and they let go of Matt McGovern – or Mike McGovern. Uh, Connor. McGovern. <laughs> Connor McGovern. <laughs> <laughs> um, this, uh, this past year. Um, so there's a lot of talk about them going. If if Worfs is available, I think he's he's the he's a perfect candidate. Like um, if, if any of the tackles um, really are are available, um, mm-hmm. they're a good candidate. Um, they they brought in uh, Bryce Callahan from Chicago from uh, Fangio's old scheme, um, but he didn't play at all last year. And there's concern of whether he's going to play again this year. So they could go if C.J. Henderson is available, they might get him. If Christian Fulton is available, they might get him. Uh, I, I tend to think that uh, John Elway, his history is to copy teams in the division. I think that's the prime reason why they drafted Noah Fant last year yeah. is because they saw Hunter Henry, they saw Travis Kelsey, and they said, we need a guy like that. Let's get Darren Noah. Waller, too. Darren Waller. Yeah. And so, the, and so Elway said, let's get a guy like that. I think he sees Tyreek Hill and says, I'm going to get Henry Ruggs. Okay. And Henry Ruggs – uh, you know, he may not be a, a number two, but he's, uh, he's an excellent he, – and he may not be Tyreek Hill. I mean, nobody, nobody really can project that. Uh, well, but no one thought Tyreek Hill was going to be Tyreek Hill coming out of college. Either. That's true. Yeah. Um, but he's – I mean, everybody's seen the tape. He's faster than lightning, and he's so athletic. One yeah. of the most athletic uh, wide receiver prospects to come out in a while. Uh, and I think that that talent is going to be unavoidable for John yeah. Elway. Uh, and if you pair him with Cortland Sutton and Noah Fant and Melvin Gordon, um, those are the tools that you want to surround a young quarterback with. Absolutely. Especially a guy with a strong arm. And that, that's the, one of the points I was going to bring up when I kind of saw where you're leaning to. You, we, we all know what the AFC is doing right now. They're gearing up to try and beat and keep up with the Kansas City Chiefs and Patrick Mahomes, right? Now, when – you take a look at some of these speedsters that teams have drafted. This is not like Al Davis taking the fastest guy in the draft a couple of years ago. These teams over the last couple of years, you take a look at Tyreek Hill, who you just mentioned, even John Ross last year, before he got injured, he was a threat at wide receiver. I mean, no there, was, 
there was uh, two or three games where he had multiple touchdowns in the game. I mean, guys with that type of speed, offensive Hollywood coordinators. And Baltimore. Exactly, exactly. All, offensive coordinators are now finding out a way to get these guys open down the yeah. field where they're not traditional wide receivers playing in the X and the Y. They're, they're slotted around. They're running cross patterns where if it's a zone coverage, they're getting behind it. If it's man, they're too fast for any defensive player to keep up with them. So I, I think that's, that's a brilliant pick there. Uh, I think you and I are both in agreement that, you know, getting a wide receiver helps the Broncos yeah. the most, most there. The one caveat to this is, again, if there's an offensive lineman available, I think they're going to take they, – they're going to be really tempted to take that. And also the thought that in the second round, they may be able to – they traded up a little bit last year to get um, Drew Locke. They may be willing to trade up a little bit if they have to to get a guy who might slip, like Jalen Rager or uh, Denzel Mims mm -hmm. or Brandon Ayuk. Yeah, I like Brandon Ayuk. He, he's a good receiver. Plus, uh, I, I think – We've seen the trend over the last couple of years of teams trading back up into the end of the first round to get a guy who they think could be just getting that fifth year option really helps team in this uh, with these salary cap issues that have been going on. For sure. Yeah. So uh, this wraps up picks 11 through 15. Matt, I want to thank you very much for joining me today. It's been really nice uh, not talking to myself and having someone else to bounce my ideas off of. It's my pleasure in this time of coronavirus to talk about anything besides coronavirus. <laughs> <laughs> All right, perfect. Well, hopefully in the 2020 season, we'll be able to drink Coronas instead of being afraid of it. <laughs> All right, thanks, Matt. Thank you, everyone, for watching, and uh, we'll see you next time. See ya.